Hello everybody. In this video we're going to be covering section 13.2, Equilibrium Constants. We're going to learn how to derive reaction quotients from chemical equations representing homogeneous and heterogeneous reactions. We're going to calculate values of reaction quotients in equilibrium constants, and we're going to learn how to do that using both concentrations and pressures. And we're going to relate the magnitude of an equilibrium constant to properties of the chemical system. So what the reaction quotient is, is it's a, it's a mathematical thing that allows us to assess uh, how far a reversible reaction is away from its equilibrium point. Basically, it gives us a number that allows us to assess where we are as uh, we reach equilibrium. Uh, it can be derived directly from the stoichiometry of the reaction. and we can use either the concentrations or the partial pressures of the reactants and products. So if I have this generic equation here, what I'm going to do to calculate the reaction quotient is that it's always the products over the reactants. So I'm going to have the product, the multiplication of the products on, in the numerator, and I'm going to take their stoichiometric coefficients and those are going to become exponents. All right, then I'm going to take the reactants, I'm going to have the product, so the multiplication of the reactants here, and I'm going to take their stoichiometric coefficients and I'm going to use those as exponents. Now, if instead of knowing the concentrations of them, I knew the partial pressures of these uh, components, I could substitute their concentrations, I could substitute in the partial pressures, and have it follow the exact same uh, sort of form where I'm still using these stoichiometric coefficients as the exponents. All right. To indicate whether I've used concentrations or pressures, we use these subscripts here. So QC is going to be one that's derived using concentrations. QP is one that's going to be derived using partial pressures. Um, we're going to have a little disclaimer here. Uh, this entire section of the book, this whole chapter, there's we don't really go into the really rigorous way that we would derive these reaction quotients and stuff. In, in actuality, what we would use is what they call relative values, um, where we've actually divided each concentration or pressure by some relative amount. And... By doing that, we would have made them dimensionless so that they had no units and everything winds up working out. Uh, we're not doing that, and at this point, it's not really necessary to do that. It would just get a little confusing. Instead, what we're going to do is we're just going to basically disregard the units of Q and K and just assume that they have whatever units they need to make everything work out correctly. So... Try not to get too caught up on the units there. Uh, before, we did look at a graph of concentration versus time. But what we didn't talk about is that this uh, can operate in either direction. Because we have a reversible reaction, uh, equilibrium can come from either direction. right? So we can start off with uh, the reactants, consume those, produce the product here, and then eventually reach some sort of equilibrium. Or we can start off with all of the products, none of the reactants, and then move left across this until we've reached equilibrium. All right. So it can come from either direction. If we look at the reaction quotient, we would calculate in either direction. Uh, it too can happen in uh and coming from either way, all right? So because we have the products in the numerator and the reactants in the denominator, we could have a situation where we start off with all reactants. That means that there's zero products in the numerator and Q starts off at zero. As it approaches equilibrium, it's gonna become greater and greater and greater, all right, until eventually it levels off at the equilibrium. The same could happen from the other way. So if we had uh, zero, or if we had all products and zero reactants, we would have essentially some number divided by zero, which would be infinity. 
So Q would start off somewhere up here at infinity, and it's going to come down until it levels off at equilibrium in that case. In either situation, it eventually converges down to this same value that we're going to call K. And K is the equilibrium constant uh, that we would know for a reaction. Okay, So the value that Q has at equilibrium is equal to K. All right? They have the exact same mathematical form, but they mean different things things. All right. Q is the value we would calculate when we are at a non-equilibrium state, and K is the value we're going to calculate once equilibrium has been achieved. All right. There's something called the law of mass action, and what this states is that at a given temperature for a given reaction, uh, the equilibrium constant is a constant, all right? Uh, it's not going to change. Um, what the consequence of that is, is that if we calculate Q for any non-equilibrium state that we're in, and we know K, we can predict what direction the reaction is going to go uh, whether it's going to move from left to right or right to left. An important thing to keep in mind here, and this is just something that has to do with the notation that they're using, is that this equilibrium constant, which is a capital italicized K, has nothing to do with the lowercase italicized Ks that we have been using to describe our rate constants. All right. Those constants have to do with the speed of the reaction. These capital Ks have to do with the concentrations that we're going to see at equilibrium. All right, they're just two separate things that unfortunately happen to both use the letter K. So how are we going to predict the direction of the reaction? So when at some point I calculate Q and I see that that is less than my known value of K, that means that there's going to be an excess of reactants, all right, and the reaction will proceed forward towards the products. When I calculate Q and it's greater than K, there is an excess of products and the reaction is going to proceed in the reverse direction towards the reactants. At some point, when Q equals K, that means that I have equilibrium. The forward and the reverse rates are equal to each other, and the concentration and products are going to remain constant. Let's look at this graphically here. We can see a couple of different scenarios. All right, so if I have this reaction right here, I could start off in a situation where Q equals zero. I have no products, okay? You can see I just have H2O and carbon monoxide there. I could start off in a situation where I don't have any of the reactants and I just have products. Q is equal to infinity. All right, I have just carbon dioxide and H2 in this scenario. Or I could start off in a situation where I have a mixture of all four of them. Okay. As the reaction proceeds, all of these Q values are ultimately going to converge to the K that I have known for this reaction in this temperature. Okay. What isn't true is that all of these wind up having the exact same composition. All right. The stoichiometry is going to take over in this situation where I will have certain stoichiometric ratios when I start with just uh, the reactants or just the products. Okay, but all of that goes out the window when I have a mixture of all four. All right, so there is more than one different kind of composition that's going to produce the same K value. But once we know the initial composition and we know the K value, 
there will only be one unique composition that is possible, and we're going to see that soon, okay? If we know the initial concentrations and we know the K value, we can find out what the end composition is going to be, but we cannot predict what the end composition is going to be just by knowing the K value. So a homogeneous equilibrium is one in which all the reactants, products, and any catalysts are present in the same phase. Uh, homogeneous equilibria take place in solutions. Okay, we've seen that we've extended the definition of solutions to include some pretty wide encompassing systems. So by definition, a homogeneous equilibrium is taking place in solutions. Um, these solutions are most commonly either liquid or gas phases. Now here is a big takeaway, all right? Because of the simplification that we are using, we're not going to be able to do this rigorously. Um, but it is important that you guys understand that what, when we go to derive the K value from a reaction, we omit any solids or liquids, meaning that they would have an S or an L as their phase here. Okay, um, so in this case where we have all aqueous, they're all included in our KC value. Okay, I put the products on the, in the numerator, I put the reactants in the denominator, I take the stoichiometric coefficient, and that becomes an exponent. All right, similarly here. But down here, where I have this pure liquid water, it does not appear in the equilibrium constant. Right, I omit that. It, what basically is going to happen is it's going to have a value of 1. All right. Similarly here, I'm going to omit that liquid water, and I'm only going to have the aqueous uh, compounds in my Kc value. Now, you do need to be careful here, okay? Because you always include all of the species that are in the gas phase even if you would typically see them as a liquid or as a solid, all right? Once they're in the gas phase, they go into the Kc, uh, um, into the Kc formula, all right? For instance, here where I have water, it's not in the liquid phase, it's in the gas phase, and it does appear in the Kc formula, okay? Now, we have heterogeneous equilibrium involves reactants and products in two or more different phases. And this is where we need to be a little bit more careful because we're going to see more of those solids and liquids pop up. One of the classic examples is going to be uh, one where I have essentially here a precipitation reaction, right? This reaction, if I put lead and chloride into a solution, it's typically going to produce lead chloride, okay? Um, you'll see that often these are actually written in this reverse order, where it looks like the lead chloride is dissolving, okay? And what we wind up here with is a product, okay? Here, for instance, we have solids on either side, the only reagent that's going to go into it is going to be that gas phase. Okay? So we do have to be really careful when we're going through these to see how which ones we're going to admit, omit. Okay? Now, when I'm doing the KP, I only include the pressure for the gas products. Okay? I'm going to omit any aqueous species I see. I'm going to omit any liquids, any solids, anything like that, okay? The only thing that goes into KP are gaseous products, okay? So here I only have one gas, so my KP is derived solely from that one gaseous uh, reactant that I'm using, okay? Again, here I have a gaseous reactant and a gaseous product, KP is derived solely from those two gaseous species that I have. All right, 
So case P and case E do not directly equal one another, but we can convert between them. Okay, they are related to one another. And we can see that relationship by first considering the ideal gas law. Okay, if all of our gas species are behaving ideally, it is a reasonable um, assumption that we're about to make. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to rearrange our gas law. So I'm going to take V, I'm going to put it over here. I now have the number of moles divided by the volume. And we know now that this is molarity. So that means that pressure is equal to molarity times RT. Keep that in mind here. All right. Now what we're going to do is we're going to substitute this result into the generic KP expression. All right. So I have all my partial pressures here. I'm substituting all of these pressures with the molarity of the uh, that species times RT raised to the exponent. Okay. If I do some algebra now, what I can see once I rearrange is that I get this guy here, which is by definition the KC for this reaction, times this whole term here. Okay, where I have RT x plus y is the total number of moles of product. M plus N is the total number of moles of reactants. Okay, if I do a little bit more manipulation, I can see that this KP is going to equal KC, where I've substituted KC in for that, times RT, the total number of products, moles of product, minus the total number of moles of reactants. So this whole part here is the change in moles, okay? It's the, dif it's the difference between the number of moles that I wound up with minus the number of moles that I started with. And that gives us our final relationship here, where Kp is equal to Kc times Rt and the change in moles. Okay, our delta n moles. I can rearrange this, right? I could solve for Kc here. Kc would be Kp divided by Rt delta n. And if I use the fact that a, I can just put a negative exponent on there, I can keep it as a product. Okay, so that Kp, Kc is equal to Kp times Rt raised to the power of negative delta n. Okay. You need to make sure that you're using the proper R value here. It should be the one that is liter atmospheres per mole Kelvin. Let's talk a little bit about coupled equilibria now. So many systems involve two or more coupled equilibrium reactions. All right. This is the case where we have one or more reactant or product species in common. The K value for a system involving coupled equilibria can be related to the K values of the individual reactions. All right. So basically what we're going to see is that we can have a set of manipulations for K values similar to the ones that we saw um, for enthalpy values before. Okay, so let's talk about what we get to do here. If I want to have a reaction and I want to change its orientation so that I make now the products into the reactants and the reactants into the products, okay, reverse its order, which would make sense given the fact that when we have a reversible reaction, we're just kind of arbitrarily choosing the reactants and the products, right? Because we can go either way, we should be able to think about them going in either way, all right? What we're going to do 
is we're going to take the reciprocal of the K values. Okay, so if I look at this one, KC is the products over the reactants, B over A. For this one here, if I took the products over the reactants, it's A over B. We can pretty clearly see that this value is 1 over this value here. All right, they are reciprocals of one another. Often we want to change the stoichiometric coefficients by multiplying every species by a value. We've done that before when we were doing like Hess's law and stuff. Okay. And we can see that when we do that, what we're going to wind up doing, if I multiply them both by some factor, is they're going to be raised to that factor over here. Okay. And the resulting KC value is the original KC value raised to the factor that I multiplied them by. Okay, so if X was 2, I would take the original KC value and I would square it to get the new KC value for that reaction. Okay, rule 3. Adding... Uh, reactions together okay this one we want to kind of go through carefully so if I wanted to add if I have this reaction here's my KC I got my again my products over my reactants here I've got my products over my reactants when I add these two together I would get this I'm going to cancel the spectators, the ones that are the same on either side, and I get this new reaction here. Okay? The KC for that is going to be C over A. Now, we want to prove that this times this is equal to that. So let's look at that here. Okay? When I had that KC1 times KC2, this is their product. I'm going to cross cancel these like I would before, I get C over A, which is the new KC value that we would have predicted for their sum. Okay? And that's pretty much it. Now we've learned how to manipulate KC values as we manipulate different reactions.